Welcome to another episode of Around the World in San Francisco. Here you can see me riding my bike on Market Street in San Francisco. I'm riding pretty fast. That's because this bike is part electric, part manual, but I still get a good workout in, which is why I like to do it. You can see my shadow there, right there. So I'm still out while the sun is out. So today I'm going to talk about why Bob Dylan is my best friend. So some people say, oh, you know Bob Dylan? No. I have actually never met Bob Dylan. The closest I've been to him was last year I went to a concert of his at, um, um, it was in Stanford, at Stanford University at the theater there. But it was really loud. It was really crowded and a lot of people were smoking and drinking and just wasn't really a good vibe for, for us. So we left like within like, maybe five or six songs and just walked around uh, the Stanford campus and area had a good time but anyway that aside I've never met him never spoken with him maybe never will doesn't matter really does not matter to me because his story is what I care about His story is really really powerful I'm gonna explain a little bit of it to you guys so, um, Bob Dylan is originally from Minnesota. He, he was born in Duluth, Minnesota, and he grew up in a town called Hibbing, which is like a really small town. So basically, um, he, you know, grew up in this small town, but he started listening to music uh, when he was young, maybe like eight, eight years old. His uh, dad got like a stereo. Um, one of those stereos that plays records and he said he'd listened to them and he said that the records actually made him feel like he was a different person as if um, you know in this Martin Scorsese documentary called No Direction Home he says um, I felt like maybe I was born to the wrong parents that's how powerful the music was to him meaning it he said it made me feel like I was somebody else so basically, um, he enrolled in school, um, like when he went to college, like he went to college, right? Graduated from high school in Minnesota and then he went to college, um, in Minnesota, but he didn't take it seriously. You know, he was like ditching classes and he was basically just playing music and listening to music all the time. And, um, he hitchhiked, like literally hitchhiked in a car in a couple of cars and went to New York um, where he went to Greenwich Village which was like the really hip scene at the time and there was a lot of live music going on in uh, different at different venues there but um, there's an interview of him that's been floating around on YouTube and it says a lot of it is titled as like Bob Dylan sold his soul to the devil like Bob Dylan sold his soul this and that and basically the the interviewer asked him like bob like why are you still doing this right because he's like 79 years old now and he's actually coming out with a new album soon right which is amazing to be that old and still be making music but the interviewer's like why are you doing this like you know you have everything and you know you're successful and you know why do you keep doing it and he basically said like um, he's just holding he said I'm holding up my end of the bargain he says the interviewer says bargain he's like yeah you know I, I made a deal you know that I would uh, see th see it through that I would keep doing this as long as I could and then the guy asks well can I ask who you made the deal with and then the Dylan says uh, the chief the one who controls this realm and the realms we can't see right so a lot of people say, oh, he's talking about Satan, he's talking about the devil, but actually he's talking about God. He's talking about the creator, the divine creator, right? Because basically as a young person, you know, when he was back there in Minnesota, he, you know, was having uh, visions of himself 
being somewhere where he wasn't at that time, right? To be be something uh, much greater than himself, right? And uh, he, you know, felt something pulling him toward that direction, and that's the the voice, right? That's the that intuition, that feeling, that inspiration, whatever you want to call it, is actually a divine thing, right? That's that's actually God leading you, and that's why he's still doing it, even though he has everything. So you know his story, regardless of. Who he is as a person, if I ever meet him, whether I meet him or not, is not important to me. You know, the important thing is the story, right? What he stands for and how he's still making music, right? 60, 60 years later, you know, that's pretty remarkable. And then the other thing you have to consider is that, you know, when he came up, he wasn't really with a band until like... 1965 so he was like on his own and he was dealing with all of that celebrity all of that fame all of that stuff by himself right it's like the Beatles right they reached up extremely high level of fame right but they had at least they had each other they could talk to each other they could go through the experience together right they had each other in hotel rooms and all of that you know, and who did he have? Who who could he like genuinely talk to? You know, uh, I don't I don't know if he could really talk to many people. So for that reason, you know, I consider him my best friend because if he can go through something like that, you know, then I can too. You know, and you know, here you see me dropping off this uh, Chipotle um, at someone's house, and you know. I do that because I'm doing this because it actually gives me my freedom you know I have freedom to continue on my journey right it's because I when I first heard Dylan I was in um, college at UCLA and I went and saw this documentary because I was in a documentary class and I saw this documentary called Don't Look Back. And uh, it's just an amazing, amazing docu documentary by D.A. Pennebaker. Basically, it follows Dylan through uh, England when he was touring there in like 1964, 65. And uh, it follows him like behind the scenes while he's performing. And I saw that. And you know what? I had never even played the guitar ever in my life. Like, I didn't even mess with it, right? But I saw that, and I was like, that's that's what I'm supposed to do, right? And I got into his music so deep, right? Listening to it constantly, playing his songs constantly. You know, I went and I bought a guitar. My first guitar was a Seagull. Like, this is how bad I, I wanted to play. Check this out. So I'm left-handed, and I wanted to play so bad that I got, like, the first decent guitar that came my way was a right-handed guitar i'm not even right-handed right so i played for like almost two years with my opposite hand of what i'm supposed to be playing with you know which is my left hand so i was like playing that whole time and i learned and i actually i became decent with my right hand but um at a certain point i couldn't keep up with certain rhythms and that I wanted to do and my finger picking like plateaued like I couldn't I was I kept trying harder and harder and I couldn't reach a higher level so I was like well maybe you know I'm left-handed and then I would switch it around and it felt pretty comfortable so finally like I made the switch like two years later right so I was like well I'm in this for the long run so I want to be like as good as I can possibly be at the guitar and that's going to be left-handed but as a side note Dylan is actually left-handed but plays the guitar right-handed so you know maybe if I stayed that way maybe I would have ended up like him I don't know but anyway I'm glad to be playing left-handed um but yeah so recently I've been playing a lot of his songs covering a lot of his songs and I do it under the name Uber Dylan because as you can see here I'm writing for Uber so that's how I fund myself right fund my music and um by being Uber Dylan, I'm adding to the story. I'm adding to basically his mythology because his name originally is not Bob Dylan. It's Robert Zimmerman. He like made up that name, 
and a lot of people not, are not sure where it comes from but if you know probably it just sounded right to him right so that's why he st he chose it and stuck with it right so um you know that's that's what i've been doing today i recorded the lonesome death of patty carroll which is a really beautiful song um it's in three four timing has a nice harmonica piece in there but it's like it tells a story of uh, a white um like a plantation owner he 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 owned like some some tobacco farm in virginia i think um and he ended he ended up killing a, one of a maid of his who was a black woman right and then he like only got six months jail for it right so dylan was a lot of his early songs especially were talking about the injustice um in the criminal justice you know in the courts particularly to black people right so all these people like talking about black lives, this and that, like, you know, that whole black lives matter thing is just a front. You know, what's really going on is what's behind them is this company corporation called Act Blue, which, um, yeah, it funds black lives matter, which we don't technically know what it is exactly, but it funds other things. It funds campaigns. It funds probably Antifa, all of these kind of things. Right. And it's all because of emotion. Right. So the death of George Floyd is similar to, you know, um, Medgar Evers. Right. There's another song Dylan has called Only a Pawn in, his, in, in the Game. Right. Where a white person kills a black person. And Dylan basically talks about how the emotion of the situation. Right. Is what propels the white person to kill the black person. And that emotion is what keeps the politician in power. Right, because he acts as he's the peacekeeper or something like that. But anyway, that's the the end of this video for now. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with some more stuff. But in conclusion, Bob Dylan is my best friend. Thank you. <laughs>